Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Microsoft Center, uh, to our book talk. Um, we do this very regularly. Uh, today is special because it's a, it's a book talk um, with an author that actually works at Microsoft. That's brilliant. Um, and it's also great to have so many people here despite holiday season and despite the bad weather. So thanks all for coming here. I want to make this very short. Um, I work here in the Brussels office um, and had the pleasure to already hear uh, Glenn. Glenn Will is a principal researcher at our Microsoft Research Center in New York City and works really on political economy. He wrote this book that really, I think, is very, um, very timely in terms of looking in how our future and our, how our society will look like. Um, he will give a presentation around the books. So I will not talk too much about the books itself, but it has thought-provoking uh, insights in there. And I hope we will then, after the 30 minutes introduction to his book, find uh, a lot of discussion points and provocative questions as well that he shall then answer. Um, and we will be guided through our Q&A and our discussion um, part of, of this book talk by Christina Kafara. She is vice president and head of the competition department of Charles River Associates um, and um, will have a wonderful conversation. She knows Glenn very well, so I'm sure most of you know her as well. So without further ado, I'll ask Glenn to come on stage. Um, a warm welcome, and we are looking forward to hear you. Uh, thanks so much. It's, it's wonderful to be here. I've been traveling around Europe for the last week uh, in many different places, but uh, being able to come back to Microsoft uh, is wonderful. I've had a great series of exchanges with the folks in Microsoft Europe, and uh, this book, as you'll see, is sort of a bold revision of how we think about politics and society, and it's the sort of integrative, interdisciplinary thinking that in many ways I think is really only possible today uh, at a place like Microsoft that has such a wide range of different types of thinkers and uh, encourages us to think in bold and yet practical ways about uh, addressing big picture social problems. So um, the book is actually joint with Eric Posner, who's a law professor at the University of Chicago. Um, and Eric has a little bit of a different personality type than me. I'm into, uh, uh, I was at the age of 10, a uh, three colored hair socialist uh, campaigning for many Democratic candidates. And at the age of 15, had become an Ayn Rand uh, loving uh, founder of a national teenage Republican organization. So I'm very into all of these different ideologies and trying to reconcile them. Eric is very much a technocratic policy analyst, and I'll get into some of the detailed policy proposals that we've come up with together. But first, I want to take you a bit more in my direction on a journey of imagination to think about how we could just imagine our political lives differently. And to do that, in the spirit of sort of science fiction, I want to ask you to begin by suspending your disbelief and coming on a journey of imagination with me to a fictive city that I'm going to call Marketopia. So Marketopia is defined by the fact that all the major private property, the buildings and the land, the airplanes and the trucks and the intellectual property is all continually up for auction to the highest bidder. And this highest bidder is allowed to possess these assets as long as she satisfies two conditions. First, she makes a monthly payment of that highest bid as a, uh, uh, into a common pool of resources for society and second, that she stands ready to surrender that asset uh, to anyone who comes along and outbids her for control of it. And while this principle is not applied to you know, personal effects and heirlooms and pets and so forth, it is applied to things we would usually think of as collective decisions, like will Marketopia exit the market union uh, that it's been a part of for many years? Where will the parks be located? Uh, who will govern Marketopia? What routes will the buses run along? Except rather than auctioning that to the single highest bidder, there will be a number of alternatives that we can take for each of these decisions. 
every citizen will submit a bid on each of these alternatives, we'll add up all the bids, and the alternative with the highest total bid will be selected. And all the money raised in this process will be continually returned to the citizens of Marketopia in an egalitarian fashion, either as they do in Norway uh, through the provision of public goods, or as they do in Alaska by sending every citizen a check, uh, what you might call a social dividend or universal basic income. So this uh, vision, your first reaction, is probably that this is the most extreme form of a free market you could possibly imagine, something that even uh, Adam Smith couldn't have come up with in a fever dream, because it uh, takes what we usually think of as a free market to such an extreme. You know, we think of ourselves as living in free market society, certainly the United States and the United Kingdom we think of as free markets, but if you really contemplate it, most assets are not available for competitive bidding in a dynamic uh, easily accessible way. They're mostly owned by bureaucratic organizations like Microsoft Corporation. And if you wanted to come and take those over and turn it into an accelerator, into some startup space, into something that's a new project, you'd have to engage in a long and drawn out process of negotiation with a corporation or a government or some uh, wealthy individual who would probably realize that you had something really creative to do with it, charge you way above the market price for it, and uh, you would probably negotiate, it would take years, and probably you know, it would eventually fall apart, or if it didn't, uh, at least it would be drawn out over some very long period of time. Whereas in Marketopia, by the very rules of the system, every asset is liquidly available, the same way that sort of things on a stock market are, or uh, you know, the way that you buy uh, commodities at stores uh, for a competitive bidding process. Now, maybe that's provocative, maybe it makes you rethink some features of our political economy, but it probably doesn't sound very attractive, right? Your, your reaction is probably that in that world, with competitive bidding for everything, the wealthy will be able to outbid everyone else for control of assets, and they'll dominate over everyone else in society. But then you have to ask yourself, what do you mean by the wealthy? What does it mean to be wealthy? It means to have wealth. And what is wealth other than buildings and roads and IP and businesses and so forth? And in Marketopia, no private individual owns any of those things. By the very rules of the system, all of the funds that are raised are equally returned to all citizens. And every citizen has an equal right to use those resources to contest for control of those assets. In that sense, Marketopia is a far more thoroughgoing implementation of the idea of common ownership advocated by this 200-year-old guy than is any of the communist systems that he actually managed to inspire in practice, which ended up degenerating into the control by a small bureaucratic elite that was all the more iron than the capitalist oppressors that they seek to replace. So that sounds like a paradox. How can something simultaneously be the most extreme form of socialism, the most extreme and thoroughgoing implementation of common ownership, and also the most extreme free market? We were all taught that free markets and socialism were supposed to be opposites of each other. Isn't that the whole way that like the you know, European Parliament is organized and its political blocks and so forth? And yet the notion that free markets are not only consistent in their truest form with socialism, but that to have truly free markets, you have to have common ownership. And on the other hand, that common ownership is impossible without a decentralized market mechanism that allows it to truly be shared among all people rather than controlled by a small elite, was not only a possibility, but the foundational dogma of the political economists of the late 19th century who inspired all the economics that any of you have studied in schools. Leon Walras, uh, William Stanley Jevons, these guys created what was called the marginal revolution, the idea of marginal utility. And all of them believed in this sort of idea that was actually most closely associated with this gentleman here. Okay, so how many people recognize this guy on the right when I put him up on the screen? Raise your hands. About half of the audience. How about the guy on the left? Now, can anyone tell me who this person is who hasn't read the book? Who said that? You said Henry George? 
That's right. That's right. Who else knew that this was Henry George? Raise, raise your hands. One person in the whole audience, right? So this guy actually outsold the last two guys by a factor of three. He was the best-selling author in the English language other than the Bible for 30 years. Uh, he inspired a whole slew of political parties in Europe. The new liberal party uh, under uh, David Lloyd George in England, uh, the Radicale Venster party in uh, Denmark, which is the party of the current uh, European Commissioner for Antitrust, um, the Venster party in Norway, which I met with when I was up there, uh, the Radical party in Italy, uh, many of uh, the canonical political, uh, George Clemenceau's uh, uh, radical party in, um, in France. And yet uh, his ideas did not fit very well with the Cold War where everything was about capitalism versus communism. And so they were largely forgotten to the public. But luckily, not entirely forgotten, they continued to develop within the field of economics through the work of one of George's most eminent disciples, uh, William Vickery, into a field called mechanism design for which Vickery won the Nobel Prize. Now, in practice, what these ideas have mostly been applied to is helping people like Microsoft price our ads and Facebook and Google and so forth. But that's not what they were intended for. They weren't intended to make profits for some narrow company. They were intended to transform society, to make it more fair and more pro productive and more uh, open and cooperative. And Vickery, who is a bit, uh, in the book we compare him to Master Yoda, he was sort of a silly, reclusive guy who was a bit hard to understand and didn't promote his own work. Uh, but uh, he was a recluse, but when he won the Nobel Prize, he thought, finally my chance to make society understand the potential of these types of ideas has come. And then he died two days later. Um, and the goal of this book is to try to draw on those ideas and to form them into a concrete set of policy proposals that allow us to actually answer the threat, the crisis really, of our times that you all are experiencing in Europe and that we are experiencing very intensely in the United States. Um, and what are those policy proposals? So the first one is what we call the common ownership self-assessed tax, which instantiates the notion of this auction in the context of private property. So the notion is that any significant corporation or individual owns big pieces of private property would self-assess the value of those assets, pay a tax, depending on the asset class, of something like 7% on it, and have to stand ready to sell that asset to anyone willing to pay the price. This would, according to a recent analysis that we did, dramatically increase the value associated with capital in the economy by allowing assets to be dramatically reallocated. Uh, for land in the United States, we've estimated that it would increase the value of land by about a factor of three, and in the process do something like increase GDP by 40%. And at the same time, it would re even if you ignore those effects, it would raise enough revenue to eliminate all other taxes on capital, pay off most of the national debt, and pay a social dividend of about $24,000 a year to every family of four. So let me give you an illustration of why it would bring these dramatic benefits that comes from the electromagnetic spectrum, an area of policy, no doubt, of interest uh, to Microsoft and uh, many others in this room. So how many people in this room have watched a over-the-air television broadcast in the last week? Raise your hand. One. How many people have listened to an over-the-air radio broadcast in this week? Not on the internet, on over-the-air. A few. How many people have used 4G, LTE, or Wi-Fi services over the last week? Raise your hand. And how many of you know that about 80% of the spectrum in Western Europe and the United States is devoted to the first set of uses, not the second? <laughs> probably many of you. So why? Well, the spectrum at present is, as illustrated in this picture from the FCC and transformed by an artist friend of mine, Mary Ellen Carroll, totally fragmented into these little chunks that are meant for those legacy purposes. 
And because they're sold under perpetual leases, effectively privatized to these private property owners who have an absolute control over that, it's incredibly hard if you want to come and buy up, say, this big chunk here of Spectrum. You have to negotiate with each of these individual people and try to get them to somehow sell you the right so that you can actually repurpose Spectrum. So instead, under the system that I imagine, a uh, broadcaster like the Q91.5 that owned, say, this pink chunk of Spectrum here would have to put a price on it of say $20 million. And it could change that at any time. It could increase it to $30 million. And um, it would have to pay a tax on the average value over time that it had assessed. So let's say it did six months at 20 million, six months at 30 million. It's gonna pay a 7% tax. So a million and three quarters uh, dollars. But from the perspective of an entrepreneur, the benefit to this is this isn't just true of this chunk here, every bit of spectrum has this. So an entrepreneur coming in not only can just circle all this stuff on some app and get a price that they have to pay for it of say $82.3 um, million dollars and immediately lock that in, but also it can know, wow, that's $100 million over there. Probably this chunk is not the right chunk to go to. This guy really is a high value use. So actually the market can then steer you away from the things that are most valuable and steer you towards the things that make the most sense for you to buy rather than this totally untransparent process of uh, bargaining and eminent domain and government-led restructuring of these things that take years and years and don't even manage to get the assets reallocated that we currently rely upon. So if Verizon did this, it could then bundle together that whole part that's really productive for them and hive off this little bit that it doesn't really need so someone else can buy it from them. So this is an illustration of the way in which we can dramatically improve the efficiency of allocation. In this world, you wouldn't have things sitting around being used for over-the-air broadcasting. Things would be reallocated. And at the same time, rather than privatizing things, rather than putting them into the hands of some private monopoly, we can keep them continually in the public sphere, continually generating that revenue so that as the space develops, as it dynamically improves, that money flows back to the public and can fund public goods and uh, equal distribution of value to citizens. Okay, so that's the first chapter of the book. The second chapter of the book proposes a new system of voting which allows minorities to defend themselves through a democratic process against the oppression of majorities, rather than relying on a bureaucracy, bureaucrats, uh, judges, or party leaders that try to make compromises among these groups. Instead, they can directly express what matters most to them through a political process. And the way that we do that is rather than every citizen getting one vote in every election or on every issue, every candidate, every citizen would be able to have a budget of voice credits that they can use to vote in favor of or against the issues, parties, and candidates that are most beneficial or most harmful uh, to them and that most address their most sacred interests. So um, I, uh, I'm going to give you an illustration with the help of my friends uh, backstage of what this looks like uh, visually. So this is a user interface that we developed that uh, illustrates the notion that you have a um, hundred credits to divide among different hot button issues like a nationwide ban on abortion in nearly a, any circumstances. So if you put one vote on that, your credits start to go down. But there's a very particular feature to the system. As you start to put more votes on an issue, you see it goes down at an increasing rate. That deters people from acting as extremists on an issue because it becomes increasingly expensive to express that preference. So everyone has an incentive to vote in proportion to how important the issue is to them, and therefore the voting process will reflect, in some sense, the total benefit to society rather than just whatever a majority happens to think. So let's go back to the slides. Um, 
Okay, so that's the second chapter. The third chapter proposes a new system of migration that would try to target the benefits of migration rather than to the wealthy corporations and employers who currently uh, get the benefits and just to the migrants themselves, but instead every citizen of wealthy countries would be able to benefit so that you would build political support for actually much higher level of migration than we currently have. There would be political demand for it. And the basis of that would be to imitate a key feature of the Canadian system, which is that individual citizens would be allowed, with some regulation from their communities, to sponsor migrants, to take some responsibility for them fitting in and adjusting to the society, and in exchange, be able to receive some payment from the migrant for providing those services. That could generate, again, a quite substantial income, something like 20,000 euros a year for a family of four, we estimate, and at the same time, uh, build far greater support for migration so that you could have uh, much more of it in wealthy countries. Fourth, we argue that antitrust competition policy, as you call it here, is critical to market economies. You can't have a market economy without competition any more than you can have democracy in a one-party state. And yet we argue that it hasn't really been tried. What do we mean by that? We calculate that about 90% of the market power in wealthy countries is completely ignored by existing antitrust enforcement. What is that? Well, uh, I'll talk first about an issue that's more relevant in the US and the UK, but is absolutely critical there. And then I'll talk about one that's also relevant in continental Europe. So about a quarter of the corporate economy is controlled uh, by four or five large investment firms, BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard. These guys are some, like basically four of the five top investors in essentially every company, in Microsoft and Google, in American Airlines and Delta. And as such, they have no interest in seeing these guys compete in product markets for consumers or in the political process. And there's increasing evidence that this is leading to higher prices, lower wages, and more centralized control over the political process by the owners of capital. This is the most iron monopoly that's ever existed in the history of capitalism because it actually coordinates all of capital against the interests of workers. And yet, antitrust, despite there being simple remedies that would have extremely limited costs to society, except possibly transferring from capitalists to uh, uh, workers, this, this idea has been completely ignored uh, by uh, antitrust enforcers, essentially. Except here in Europe, there's an investigation under ongoing that uh, Commissioner Vestager uh, has put in place, which is interesting, and we'll see where it goes. But at present, antitrust has done nothing about this. And all this issue is overwhelmingly discussed by financial elites in the financial press, et cetera. And the public is not thinking about it. So I, I think this is an incredibly important issue. Uh, second, Antitrust completely ignores the power that employers have over workers and focuses only on the power that companies have over their consumers. But anyone who's ever wa worked a job knows that an employer has far more power over their workers than do uh, companies over their consumers. And yet when two steelmakers go to merge and they uh, think about their effect on the European steel market, they don't care whether they merge all of the steel making in some part of Germany, as long as there's something else that the other companies have in France that can compete with them. This is totally crazy. It affects the livelihoods of all of those people, and that's totally ignored by current antitrust enforcement. Finally, we argue that the data that all of us produce every day that gets hoovered up by uh, uh, Facebook and Google and even us at Microsoft in, in our activities is what is training the artificial intelligence and machine learning systems that everyone is saying is gonna put us out of jobs. But we're the ones who are doing all the work to train that. It's not humans being displaced, it's unpaid labor of humans displacing paid labor of humans. In fact, there's an interesting story that I learned about uh, when, when doing one of these tours 
about the beginning of the motion picture industry. So Thomas Edison got a patent on the notion of going around the streets videotaping people, going about their daily activities. And he, that was the original motion pictures. And then to get around his patent, some uh, French filmmakers decided, we're going to do a new creative thing. We're actually going to pay people. We're going to put them in a composed way. They're going to be called actors. And uh, just like the stage actors. And rather than saying that the video, the artificial actor, is displacing actors, we're actually going to have actors replace actors, right? And that created an industry where actually you could make a livelihood by becoming an actor. And it made much better movies because people actually got good at becoming an actor. And they had a chance to be represented by a union. And they got credit for the work that they did. And we are now in the Edison model, not in this French model, in the data economy. And if we organize collectively to bargain with these tech companies, if we create data labor unions, as we call them, um, at, and as was first created actually by a Dutch socialist member of the European Parliament just down the road, uh, Paul Tang in Holland, uh, we can get a fair share of the digital economy so that we get better quality data because people will be compensated for what they do. And we can decentralize the political and social power of the platforms away from this uh, concentrated arrangement that we currently have to a much broader inclusion of uh, different social groups. Okay, so these are very radical ideas. They are not things that we would advocate implementing overnight. And in fact, for each of the ideas, we have very uh, near-term, narrow, practical applications like the spectrum example I gave you. But there are many others for each of these ideas. But we portray it as a broader, bolder ideology because we think it's something the world desperately needs. Today, the big ideas about how to transform our societies are not coming from liberals and those who believe in market-based systems. They're coming from the Steve Bannons of the world who want to take our society back to the closed, misogynistic, uh, uh, nationalistic societies of the 1950s. And the only real alternative is from people who have in mind a state socialist model like Jeremy Corbyn does that is incredibly intimately tied to that sort of nationalist closed society. And at the same time, power is increasingly concentrating into a very small number of hands. And our popular culture is not offering us much of substance uh, to combat this. So we're dealing with, I think, a real crisis in our society. In inequality is increasing. Productivity is falling. We have political conflict. And yet, we don't have a vision that is bold and creative of how we can offer a form of liberalism that's up to this challenge. And yet there are social forces that are starting to mobilize around precisely that sort of thing. Anthony Appiah, a mentor of mine uh, and philosopher at NYU, is increasingly articulating a vision of how we can have a di diverse and inclusive society that still recognizes people's needs for identity and meaning. Vitalik Buterin, the founder of Ethereum, and DevCon, their biggest conference is going on this week, and I'm going to give the closing keynote on Friday. Vitalik has been uh, trying to de describe how we can have a more decentralized technical infrastructure that doesn't put the power in the hands of so few of these large platforms. And he and I have been collaborating very actively on using some of the ideas in the book to make that happen. Um, Zanny Minton Beddoes, uh, editor of The Economist, had a wonderful uh, uh, manifesto on for their 175th anniversary a couple months ago that I really recommend that you all go read, which actually adopted a lot of the rhetoric from the book and that has a um, vision of how we can make liberalism a radical force for social change again. Uh, and it is really starting to formulate uh, social groups around this. And of course, while Politicians always have to be more cautious than others. I do think that Commissioner Vestager is starting to sketch out, based on the principles of her party, based on this social liberal tradition that she represents, which is very connected to the ideas in the book, uh, 
thoughts about how we can have a market-based liberal solution that is nonetheless egalitarian and addresses the concerns about declining communities and so forth. So I think partly because of this global context, the reaction that we've gotten to the book has really been incredible. Uh, I went around touring for three months starting in mid-April, and by the middle of the summer, I learned that there had been several billions of dollars invested in all sorts of startups around these types of ideas, that large companies were getting engaged with it, that there were activist groups forming, um, artists doing product projects on this stuff. And we decided we needed to try to catalyze all this together into a social movement. So about two months ago, we started an organization called Radical Exchange that's going to put on a 500-person conference in March. And we already have 40 people uh, wanting to uh, volunteering 10 or more hours of their time a week, uh, helping to organize all of this. And in fact, we have a queue of about 100 other people who want to do it, and we're trying to find a way to get them all involved. It's run by... Jeffrey Lee, uh, um, who's our executive director. But we don't want this to be about economics, where I come from. We want it to be about social transformation. And social transformation requires bottom-up action. It requires diffusing these ideas so they become part of the awareness of people throughout society. It requires experimentation and communities that learn to use these things. It requires further development of the ideas, not just by economists, but by all sorts of people, and the organization of clubs all over the place. And this is what is starting to happen. And each of these is led by an amazing and, and really diverse cast of people. We have Ananya Chakravarti leading ideas and research. But again, she's not an economist. She's a post-colonial histor historian uh, at Georgetown University. Um, leading entrepreneurship and technology, we have Mamie Rheingold, the head of the largest Ethereum conference. We have a wonderful artist leading arts and communications who does great stuff about data slavery and about the asymmetric power of corporations and incorporated herself to deal with a lot of these things. And while all those people sort of are more traditionally from different parts of the left, you might say, we actually also have a huge engagement by libertarians uh, who believe in the market-driven uh, vision uh, that's related to this. So Mark Lutter, the most prominent advocate for charter cities, is running our activism and government track. And I hope some of you will feel inspired to get involved in this in some way. Uh, we need to make this something where we push power outwards and where all sorts of people get involved in how we can answer the populist message, which reacts to real failings in our current system but doesn't have answers, with something that embraces diversity and openness, technology and markets, and uses these as channels uh, to address the biggest problems facing our society. And to discuss all this, I am thrilled uh, to have uh, someone who's starting to get maybe a little bit involved, uh, a, a collaborator and friend for many years, uh, Christina Kafara. Well, it is a pleasure indeed to be here and to be starting the discussion over these issues. I think I was one of the first, perhaps, to um, hold a talk over your book in yeah. London. Um, and I think um, it is particularly uh, interesting to think back about that. It's an event that took place in May. I invited a bunch of, a selected bunch of people, the board of the Competition and Markets Authority in the UK, various lawyers, there were business uh, representatives, publishers, uh, uh, Apple and uh, Google. And the discussion that uh, Glenn sort of led was pretty much around the book and around these themes. The initial reaction of the audience was, uh, I should say, consternation at some of your ideas. But I think uh, as the evening evolved, there was incredible participation and enthusiasm uh, and, and, and exchange because what you do is capture, I think, a, a, a very deep sense uh, of, of the need that we have to think about many things afresh and to think about things in a different way that is pervasive, even for those of us who are boring enough to be steeped in antitrust on a daily basis and are not quite as, as, as wide-ranging, as creative as you are, there is no doubt that we are in the midst of a sense of an inflection point that we're living through. Many sort of, many, many data points around that. There are hearings at the FTC about how we should think about uh, reforming antitrust. So I, I will uh, just open the discussion and then um, I, I'm hoping that the rest of the audience will 
jump in. But um, as a starting point, I think I would like to take you back, not perhaps to the first uh, and the most ambitious <laughs> and radical of your proposals, because of course we are in Brussels and many people in this room are interested in policy around yeah. uh, things like data, like digital, which are pretty much the kind of things we are discussing very much on a daily basis. Yeah. Let me take you to one of the things that inspired and created a lot of discussion at the London event, and in fact, even at the DG competition event that we attended the next the day, next where day, you yeah. gave another talk, is this idea about data is labor that yeah. you sketched briefly um, earlier. And, and, and you know, we, we wring our hands and we talk about data. Uh, there's been an evolution. We've been thinking about data as something perhaps as a, we, we don't think about it as an essential facility. Are we thinking about it uh, in the right way in, in antitrust? And, 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 and really your, your proposition <laughs> is that uh, the way in which we are addressing that issue is, is really wrongheaded unless we really understand that there is uh, uh, the, the way to think about it is as a, as a trade. Consumers are both users of internet but also sellers of that information on the internet and the way in which perhaps the data question can be uh, gotten around in a meaningful intelligent way is really t t sort of understanding the implication of it and the need for collectively perhaps bargaining around the value of that data. Yeah. Now you have an article also in the, in the Harvard Business, Re Business Review that talks further about this yeah. recently about um, essentially uh, intermediaries that could be representing our data. Can you, can you elaborate a bit more yeah. on that? So I think, you know, um, I come from an economic place, but my perspective is increasingly broadening beyond the pure economics. Because at the more I think about it and the more I engage with different civil society actors, the more I realize that the economic issues, the fact that the value of data is going so disproportionately to these platforms, is really just the most measurable and quantifiable aspect of a much broader problem, which is one of centralization of power. People increasingly feel that their attention is not under their control, that they're being pushed this way and that way. Every, you know, the number of people who make their screens go gray so that they don't react to the technology. Um, people don't feel they're in control of the information that they're mm -hmm. getting, that they're getting all this misinformation. So it's not just the economic aspect. Really, power in, in, in many different aspects of our lives is shifting towards this very centralized set of people. And I tell you, I went to Norway, and the Norwegians, they're a very reasonable, very thoughtful set of people, but the reaction that they have, they feel that the, this concentration of power, it's really a threat like totalitarianism. They really feel, and, and, and they're not, given to these sorts of hyperbolic things, but the number of people from across the political spectrum mm -hmm. who really mm -hmm. felt that there's this extreme concentration of power in a very small number of places. And, and the economics is a representation of that. So the, the labor share of national income is a standard economic measure. That has traditionally been about 70%. And it's fallen to about 60%. But in the data economy, in Facebook, in Google, it's down to about five to ten percent. That is an economic representation of a much broader phenomenon. There is this concentration of power around a small number of capitalists. And that, I think, is very worrying. And what we need to do is what we did in the 1930s and 40s in some sense. We built up labor unions. We built up civil society so that never again it would be the case that atomized people are left naked in front of the centralized power of the state created by capitalism because it stripped away all those other institutions and by technologies like the radio and, and you know, later the television that allowed this broadcast communication. And I think that is what we need to do today. We need to build up a far more robust and diverse civil society, not bring back the old newsstands. Technology has moved beyond that. Not bring back old things and, and worry about that, but instead build a new society with new organizations that can play that role of creating a dense, complex mesh that defines our society rather than the platform and the isolated individual. Yeah, but explain how the idea would work. What is a data union? How I what is a MID? You talk yeah. about 
an intermediary there. Would this thing happen spontaneously by happenstance? There needs to be some yeah. facilitation. Absolutely. Uh, for this to take place, just, yeah. just get yeah. concrete. So the, way, the way I think about it is that social change is always a process of several things intersecting, and, and the labor movement is a perfect example of that. People, as they came to see each other in a similar situation, started to form organizations, and eventually these organizations started to take action against employers. And for a while, the state suppressed this, and then the state enabled people to take this action and helped encourage it. And what we need is a combination of awareness through companies, companies like Microsoft, companies like uh, even like Facebook or whatever, paying people for their data. So people start to get, oh, I'm adding this value. I deserve something for this. That will start to lead them to want to form these organizations. But then we also need support from governments. The GDPR, unfortunately, has far too individualistic of a view of how you exercise your rights over data. And no person is on their own capable of grasping all the ways in which their data are being used, of reading the terms and conditions. I actually went to Facebook and I gave a talk there. And they brought me in to the building just three minutes before I needed to give the talk. And they said, oh, there's these terms and conditions. We just need you to sign these and then you can go in and give your talk. And, and so uh, you're s I'm supposed to read this in three <laughs> minutes? In fact, you couldn't even scroll through the thing in three minutes, right? So that is impossible. But if we organize collectively, and we can form organizations, they can do that bargaining. And they can have the market power to do that bargaining, just like labor unions do. And they can help us manage our attention by helping setting those things. And all this censorship and news quality stuff, there's no way that a big platform can do all that. It turns into a totalitarian thing. And you don't want it to be run by a state, because what if Marine Le Pen gets elected, you know? And then it switches over to that. So what we need is a way for people to have organizations that are large enough to actually manage these complex issues, but that aren't just the whole. That's what civil society is about, and that's what's been decimated by the digital world for some good reasons, but we have to build that back up. But I think your point and the interest of what you say, I mean, aside from just the big uh, picture rhetoric, if you like, uh, is, is really that concretely, uh, none of us is going to negotiate with a platform for the value of our data. What yeah. your proposal is about is, can we, envisage collective organization that much like the unions in, in the past with labor would be capable of negotiating Absolutely. and extracting the value of our data so that the price signal is established once again exactly. in a way that in a market economy thing, we think, we think sh it should be. We are, we are all kind of the victims of, of this free thing. So I think that's the most concrete way to Absolutely. think about it and, and the one that I, I And, and I there's about 50 of these organizations that have already started. There's been about $3 billion of capital invested into them. So this is a very real, tangible thing that is going on. What we need is the awareness and that's one thing that this book is trying to bring. Mm. That, you know, and, and, and the way of conceptualizing it so people can get a handle on the way in which they're being taken advantage of. Yes. Well, let me, let me move on to another thing, but I'd yeah. like to sort of stop and give people the opportunity to jump in. Just one of the other proposals that you come up with, which is dismembering the octopus. Yeah. And this is a discussion that we have been exposed to in Brussels. The discussion over common ownership is kind of landed here too, and it has been mostly associated with work you're obviously very uh, aware and close to, which is empirical work that has uh, purported to show that there are uh, empirical effects associated yeah. with this yeah. uh, common ownership uh, 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 sort of phenomenon. And I know that you, uh, uh, and, in, and in fact there has been skepticism expressed about yeah. the significance of this empirical work, and there is work that is kind of countering now. We yeah. were both in Chicago, and I heard you yeah. saying in Chicago to Martin, look Martin, I don't believe the empirics, I just believe the theory. Yeah. What, can you uh, elaborate on, on that, and how yeah. do you say it? Look, I think the fundamental thing, and this is what you I mean you by radical. You say I don't care about the empirics. Whatever the empirics uh, says, I don't care. I like well, the theory. Look, look, I think that the empirics can inform us, and if they're really definitive, they can inform us. But, but the fundamental thing here is that we have something in economics that I think is really bad. And this is what radical antitrust and radical markets more broadly is trying to do. People think economics is really right-wing and conservative and you know, defending you know, capitalism and whatever. And the reason that they think that is not because that's what economic theory says. It's because whenever the economic theory defends those things, economists talk about it. And when it goes the opposite way, economists say, oh, well, but the world is very complex. Maybe economics doesn't apply in this case. That's bullshit is what that is. 
we need to take economic theory seriously to its logical conclusions. Everyone on Econ 101 learns about public goods. And then how come we don't ever talk about public goods in economics? Everyone in Econ 101 learns about monopsony power. How come we don't talk about monopsony power? Here is a case where you have four investors owning 25% of the corporate economy. They have every incentive and every ability to cause all that to collude. You better give me some pretty strong empirical evidence to persuade me that that's not a problem. <laughs> now, maybe there is that evidence out there. But, but since when do we think it makes sense to put four dudes, and they are dudes, <laughs> let me tell you, in charge of controlling the whole economy? And you know what it leads to, if you don't address it this way, Christina, is there's a guy named Matt Brunig. I don't know if anyone's followed his work. Very interesting guy. He says, look, We've got four guys in charge of the economy and they're running it for the capitalists. Let's just nationalize all that stuff. Because if they don't do anything, if what the, their defenders say, we're, oh, we're just hands off, is true, then who needs these guys? Let's just bring it all into public ownership. Let's have the government vote all those shares. So yeah, the government can just passively sit there. That's what you're going to get. Because that's the logical conclusion of that concentration of power. What we want is a dynamic, competitive economy. We want to take economics seriously and take it through to its conclusions rather than concentrating all this power and saying, oh, so somehow, even though they have the incentive, even though they have the ability, they're just not going to do it because that's just not how these guys are good guys. That's not how they operate. <laughs> So much for evidence-based policy making. Yeah. Um, but uh, um, I'll, I'll say one other thing. I'd like your views yeah. on one more thing, and then I'll, I'll be quiet and yeah. kind of take take views from the. Ocean. I mean, the, the sort of moving on from the sort of the common ownership and the broader sort of discussion that is very live in Brussels, in London, everywhere in DC about uh, the, the sort of where where antitrust. I know that yeah. you are not someone who practices antitrust as a as a as a sport on a on a daily basis, but certainly you have views on 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 where we are. We we all know in this kind of city how enforcement works and we have taken actions, yeah. there's been discussions about uh, whether this is effective. And the big debate out there is um, we are at a point where we are rethinking possibly the sort of range of tools that we're using because, you know, is antitrust really capable of dealing with the realities of digital, the fact that we yeah. see uh, these great platforms effectively uh, occupying the space. And there is a big discussion about what is it then? Is it regulation under what guise? What yeah. kind, can we do it intelligently without wrecking the thing? Or can we rely on other forms of organization which may have to do with private initiative or, or perhaps regulation favored initiative? I'm, I'm talking yeah. about things like uh, code of conduct yeah. or some sort of SSO type, um, you know, collective Jean Tirol talks about participative antitrust, collaborative antitrust, sitting industry and users around the table. Do you, do you have views on, on, on the, the sort of the... the so the, that, that sort I, of I have a very radical view of antitrust, no but, really. also, but also a very simple <laughs> view of antitrust. So I really don't think that antitrust, and this is somewhere where maybe I'm more right-wing at some level, I don't think antitrust should get into this business of you Google, you do this product, you don't do this product, I, 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 or you, know, you get a fine because you close this. I don't think that this makes a lot of sense. The reason I don't think that this makes a lot of sense is that antitrust has to have a basis in clear public legitimacy. If it can't make its standards clear to business, business can't follow it, it leads to unpredictability. And if the public doesn't understand the principles, if it gets into an incredibly complex model analysis of something, you know, empirics has its role, but if it gets into the weeds of that stuff, it loses its base in the public. And if it loses its base in public legitimacy, it loses its ability to actually do the things it needs to do, like take on this uh, labor market power, take on the, uh, the institutional investors. So I believe in antitrust that is simple, clear, and cuts through things. I think for other issues, we're much better to rely on unions. We're much better to rely on different forms of organization where people can bargain because otherwise the antitrust becomes a regulator. And when the antitrust becomes a regulator and it relies on economics and it relies on technocracy and it's cut off from the people, I think that's putting too much power in the hands of some bureaucracy and inevitably that's going to come to be 
viewed as illegitimate. So I believe in, we take simple principles of economics, like you shouldn't have the same people controlling a bunch of competitors. <laughs> and you shouldn't just let companies buy up potential competitors of theirs. And you don't focus on um, economic calculations down to the nth degree. You focus on simple, clearly articulable principles that can be broadly understood. And maybe you bring in venture capitalists to think about this issue of who might compete. Uh, people with that sort of training, rather than just with an economics demand estimation sort of a training. And you bring them into antitrust a in ways that, again, can communicate with the public. Ra and, and you leave that to antitrust. And then in these other areas, you think about things like unions or standard setting, or maybe there, there is a role for regulation, but it should be transparently regulation rather than put under the guise of antitrust, I think. Well, I, I think I'd like to hear views or questions if anyone has. Oliver? Yeah. Uh, hi, so Oliver Leif from uh, CRA. So yeah. th the opening policy proposal you had is this sort of perpetual auction. Yeah. And it's, um, it's thought-provoking, it's, it's interesting, I think quite alarming probably for a lot <laughs> of people. Um, but then the, the, the policy proposal at the end of the section is, was the spectrum auction, which is in some ways kind of quite, kind of a little bit sort of prosaic almost and kind of technocratic. So I was just wondering if you could kind of articulate, you know, where between those two extremes would you actually like to end up? You know, how would this policy principle, uh, how, should it, how should it look in your view between those two extremes? And you know, what, what would you like to see change to kind of apply these principles in reality? Um, I believe that the economist's view, which Al Roth called uh, whispering in the ears of princes, we, the brilliant economists, come up with some idea. We then go and talk to some te technocratic expert. They go and press a button, and the policy is implemented. Is precisely the opposite of the attitude that one has in a democratic state. In democracies, we don't have princes. In democracies, we talk to the people, and the people ultimately make policy. And so I believe in doing those technocratic experiments to help build awareness and to help test these things and to improve them. But ultimately, change comes from having these ideas pervade the notions of the public, from having civil society organize and come to understand these, from having burning mans you know, that are organized on these principles and people coming to see that actually that can work, from having artists and virtual reality experiences and video games where people understand this. And then eventually people see it works much better and they're going to demand it on a broader range of things. So we start with the technocratic things, both because those are the most plutocratically owned things and it will be the least threatening to people, but also we learn there. But it's not just that. That is not the main thing. The main thing is to have things come to pervade the consciousness of the public. And that's one of many vectors for doing that. And that's the right way we should imagine uh, policy. The, the right way to approach policy is not whispering in the ears of princes, it's talking to the people. And it's building a coalition among the people to take down the princes. That, that, that's, that's my perspective on it. Um, I, one thing I would really request if, if people are open to it is I would love to get questions from a diverse range of people. Ideally, if there are some women in the audience who'd be interested in asking questions, uh, I think that would be uh, great. Yes, I got, I got some from you too, Christina, but, but I, I'd like to encourage others as well to join in the conversation. Not a woman, but you can speak. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Glenn. It was a very interesting uh, talk. I want to go back uh, to data as a labor. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you if you could give us a concrete example how much a person can earn by using Facebook uh, under this model. And a second related question is, um, let us assume that there is uh, a big platform and yeah. a very small one. Uh, under data as labor, uh, the small one should also make an offer. Could uh, even compete with a big one or probably your model will, uh, will increase the entry barriers to enter this market? Yeah. That's a great pair of questions. So first of all, um, right now, the whole digital economy is demonetized. Everything is free. That's the way that it used to be for women in the household. Everything was free. Women just wanted to take care of the kids. They just wanted to take care of the house, right? And then we started having something called the feminist movement. And the feminist movement said, 
maybe women should have an opportunity to go into the labor force, right? Maybe they actually are adding value to the economy and that should be recognized. And what started happening? They started earning money. They started being successful. They started making society a lot more humane. And at the same time, opportunities opened up for care work in homes because it wasn't all just put on the women. And a whole new economy was created where formerly everything was just off the books. Right now, we're spending two hours a day, three hours a day, four hours a day on average in wealthy countries on these platforms. And yet, there's no money we can pay out to workers. It's all just free. Th that is the result of the ideology and the power yeah, the that the platforms have. Much. Yeah, and, and if you take that seriously, let's say three or four hours a day, what fraction of our economy should that be? If it's one quarter of people's attention a day, one fifth of people's attention a day, it's probably 10, 15% of GDP. If you have usual labor shares and it gets usually distributed throughout the economy, which it's not being at present, that should add up to something like, according to our calculations, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year for a family of four. But that's once there are prices on everything. If you just take the current profits of those companies and just divide them up, you're not, you're, you're not going to get nearly that amount. It, you're going to get something more like, I don't know, 100 to 700 euros, depending on how you calculate it, once you take into account all the things per uh, person. But once you actually bring prices into the rest of the economy, then uh, there's much more. And then the second thing that you were, you were saying is, and there's actually a wonderful pr paper on this by Chris Tanetti and Chad Jones, there's a strong interest that a union that creates this has in fostering competition for the value of the data that they have. So they would have a huge interest in fostering entrance and trying to charge more to incumbents rather than trying to exclude entrance. If you just put a uniform price on it, everyone gets charged the same, that's not going to happen. But a union absolutely would not want to see that happen. They want to see more competition. So they'd want to allow those entrants to enter and to allow public uses to do it. And on the other hand, to uh, charge a lot to the current incumbents. Hi, many thanks for the very fascinating talk. Uh, my name is Anselm Rodenhausen and I work for DG Connect. Uh, that's the part of the European Commission that deals with the digital sectors. So yeah. I am tempted to ask you a digital question, how yeah. new technologies such as blockchain, for example, yeah. might help you implementing all these fascinating ideas yeah. that you have in your book. But I'm also an ex-competition lawyer, so I rather would like to ask you a competition law question as you were just addressing the topic, yeah. but a rather odd one, which yeah. is what do you think might be the work-life balance of an employee of the MAA? And with the MAA, I'm referring to the Marketopia Antitrust Authority. Would these employees, if I were an employee with this authority, would I be as busy as an employee for Margaret Vesterger at DG Comp right now? Or would I rather have a chilled life because the system, as you set it up itself, guarantees for a certain competition within the market players? So the whole, the underlying question is the whole concept of common ownership. Do you think it per se automatically guarantees a certain level of competition, it automatically prevents the setting up of oligopolies, uh, or in your system might there be other um, concerns, other forms of market failure that then might keep the MAA busy? Yeah. Uh, I love the questions and I'm going to do my best to answer both the question you didn't ask and the question you did ask in one go. Uh, so. In the long term, the vision here is to establish eventually using things like blockchain and using mechanisms that can run on them, forms of social organization that require less and less concentrated bureaucratic authority to enforce them. However, many of the individual proposals that we make don't get you all the way there. So for example, just that property regime that I told you about on its own is still going to allow people to potentially buy up assets that are, that can create substitutable products 
And if you do that, they'll actually have a higher value from a purely private perspective, and a competition authority needs to stop that from happening. So that might actually create more work for a competition authority. However, eventually, there are bolder versions of these ideas that combine quadratic voting and that, something called liberal radicalism, which I have a paper on with Vitalik Buterin, which would actually eliminate the need for market power in society at all, because it would have public goods-based funding in a decentralized way to replace the, the current corporate form. And in that world, that probably wouldn't be relevant at all. So marketopia does not mean market utopia. Actually, marketopia, topia means place. So it's marketplace. It's a step. But it's not the final thing. And we want to go further. And maybe eventually uh, we can have something in which the role of bureaucrats and judges and so forth becomes thinner and thinner and thinner over time, which is the hope. But I would love to get a question from a woman if anyone's willing to ask one. Yes. Oh, yeah, Two. Isabel. That's great. Over there? Okay. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Um, so I'm working on climate change policy, and I was wondering yeah. how your book uh, deals with that and yes. sort of the need for markets to address uh, this core market failure. And um, I mean, just taking the example of your voting system, you talked about minorities, but it would still apply to sort of one uh, bounded entity. And so, I mean, sometimes on some of those questions, you might have it that um, the, there are several votes going towards, let's say, um, you know, a policy question that actually affects people living outside that territory. And so unless you apply it globally, I'm not really sure how, how this would actually address uh, and so necessarily yeah. the imbalance that we're looking at. And yeah. especially, I mean, because the question is um, kind of steered towards climate change, but I mean, there is a huge element of climate and justice, that yeah. um, you are having a minority polluting a majority and risking the lives of a global majority. And I'm just wondering how exactly you've um, reckoned with that in yeah, the book. That, Thanks. That's a, that, so first of all, in the book, I don't do it directly. We don't do it directly. But uh, two things, both a near term and a fur further term version. So in the near term, um, I actually think quadratic voting is the thing I'm most excited about using it for is international negotiations. Because right now, a big reason why there's so little legitimacy in international organizations is because there are even more at a global level than on a more local level uh, difficulties of dealing with the disproportionate interest that certain uh, individuals or different countries have in different issues. That happens in the national level, but the, the more abstract you get, the more diverse you get, the more important it becomes to try to deal with these minority-majority dynamics and things that particular groups want to weigh in and others don't. So I think in the context of a climate negotiation, the use of a mechanism like quadratic voting, or more broadly in the UN or in the EU, is actually more important than it is within any narrower community. So I think there's significant potential of using those in the context of those negotiations, both for the negotiation protocol and more broadly for organizing those groups. And it actually corresponds to a lot of things you already see. You see these veto points for large countries and so forth. You, could, you can sort of build that in a much more continuous and thoughtful way into something like quadratic voting than you can in the standard mechanisms. In the future, however, in the more abstract thing, in this liberal radicalism thing that Vitalik and I are developing, we actually have a vision of what we call polypolitanism, which is a world where maybe the nation state exists, but it's constantly coming into existence by the free, free choices of participants. But on the other hand, you can't just leave collective organizations. Collective organizations are funded on the basis of a public good principle rather than on the basis of capitalism. And organizations that get effectively donations from many citizens, and especially in small ways, get more funding. So there's this incentive for larger organization in proportion to how much that's the right level to deal with things. And so rather than there being the nation state or the corporation or any of these things, there would be a whole range of different organizations that would solve different public goods-based challenges. And my hope is that in the longer term, that instead of having these fixed organizations, you actually have things endogenously emerging from some system like that that can solve all these different types of challenges. Isabel? Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Isabella. I work for the German Consumer Organization here in Brussels. Um, I'm a fish in the civil society water here in Brussels, so your questions about concentration of power I found really interesting, yeah. but if you look at the funding of a lot of civil society organizations, particularly in the United States, they get funding from maybe two handfuls. It's not as concentrated maybe as the yeah. VC market, but just from a handful of foundations, and the money again there comes very often from capitalist donors. It's the yeah. same for universities. Yeah. How do you address that problem? That's a great question, and this again lets me get a little bit deeper into this liberal radicalism thing. So right now, th take the example of news media. News media is a classic example where current models are totally broken. Capitalism is crazy for news media. I mean, it's like, imagine you discovered Donald Trump is owned by the Russians, and the number of people, like the value that that would bring to society versus the number of people who would go to any particular newspaper to read about it and would see ads for a few seconds. It just, it's just not, there's just like no relationship there. It's a completely crazy way of thinking about the value that's created there. So it needs to be thought of as a public good. But do you want the government funding that public good? That, that's, that's even crazier, right? I mean, maybe in some places that can work out with huge trust and years and years. And whatever, but, but in many places, the government ends up controlling the things that it funds. Um, do you want Jeff Bezos funding that and choosing, I want this thing, I go and fund that? So what we need is some new mechanism which allows maybe these large organizations to provide funding, but in a way that is not centrally controlled that actually is going through some sort of market process, but not a market process based on capitalism, some other sort of a market process. So what we propose is this mechanism we call liberal radicalism, which is basically like matching funds. This is some intuition I think lots of people have. You give contributions, and then there's some central fund that matches that, but in a way that doesn't discriminate across organizations. But what do you want to do? You want to match smaller contributions more, Right? Because those are the people who are most likely to feel like a free rider, like they're just a drop in the bucket. On the other hand, you want to fund organizations that have many contributors more, rather than just a few, because those are ones that are getting that sense of collective value and that make each individual a small part, so they don't want to make the contribution. And so we have a formula that actually does that in an optimal way, that again takes basic economics seriously. It just says, if you want to have a market that solves the first and second fundamental welfare theorem, just the most basic economic stuff, but for public goods, not for private goods, there's a simple formula that does it. And that has all these properties I was just describing to you. I won't go into the mathematics of it, but that's the sort of thing we're trying to think of. Take basic economics really seriously, and it can actually address these big social and sociological problems that other fields have usually criticized the economics about because it's not true to its own principles. Hello, Thibault Larger, Politico. Uh, I have two questions for yeah. you. You seem uh, to rely a lot on decentralizing markets and the yeah. state and so on and so forth. But I, have, I, I, I fear that there's maybe a tension because uh, you can see it in two ways. Yeah. The first one is uh, a state is a process of a democracy. It comes out of a democratic process. So there's voting, competition between political parties, and so on and so forth. Uh, so maybe the for five years, you will have a concentration of power. But five years afterward, it may ch change. And you say, well, state, don't count on the state because of Marine Le Pen, yeah. maybe. Second, you say companies, they are evil. Let's not count on them to decide on what we want. And then you suggest unions and organization. But I can see that at the same time, they are prone to capture by interest groups also. So how do you solve this? Because you seem to replace one form of, of, of um, uh, control, uh, Pockets of power with another um, yeah. uh, form of pockets right. of power. Second one is de decentralization is works when there's also when information is also decentralized. Right. So all the, the the proposals that you suggest in your book, I have the impression that they stresses the need for better education and to reduce the inequality in education. 
and also the, the problem of, it, of disinformation. Uh, the I had written something very interesting yeah. here. Yes. <laughs> so does this element, uh, the, the market failure or the, the friction that come from the inequality in education, does this make you, could you, could make you rethink the costs and benefits of yeah. full decentralization? Yeah. So I think that's a wonderful question. It cuts to the core of the project, and it's actually the topic of the talk that I'm giving on Friday at the Ethereum conference, which is called Decentralization Against Isolation. And I think the fundamental problem with many instantiations of the liberal idea are that they assume that we can, as isolated individuals, exercise our freedom. And that's impossible for all the reasons that you were talking about. Liberalism, I think, fundamentally, and, and that's the principle here, that's all that decentralization really means at some level, is an opposition to arbitrary, historically derived, concentrated, hierarchical authority. And that's a principle that runs throughout this. But naive forms of liberalism that leave individuals isolated on their own, that don't organize them collectively, will leave them naked in the face of any central authority that comes to grab that power. So instead, what you need to be an individual, what you need in order to have a chance of thriving and protecting your liberty is all the communities that you're a part of that are diverse, that are constantly changing and adapting to conditions and not getting stuck rigidly in a form that is just historically derived and hierarchical. And so that is, I think, the fundamental principle. We need to embrace collective organization. We need to provide the facilities for collective organization. But we need to ensure that the collective organization is adaptive, is novel, and is constantly coming into being. And that's precisely what liberal radicalism as a mechanism tries to do, but also the principle that is guiding all these other suggestions that I'm making are to as much as possible imitate the outcome that would come out of that mechanism of that sort of optimal provision of public goods through constantly evolving new sources of collective organization that countervail against the power of those rigid, hierarchical, overgrown, uh, unadaptive forms of organization that have now been uh, established. Because we need that because we can't on our own uh, do that. So we can't have decentralization that means isolated individuals. I think Carol wanted to say something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I very much appreciate hearing you for the second time. It's yeah. very exciting to, you know, get more clarity about these ideas. Yeah. Um, about a month ago, uh, I, I think it was the same chair. Um, there was a German historian giving a book talk about was yeah. auf dem Spiel steht, what's at stake. And, mm. and his basic proposition was not very optimistic about change. And what he, he was saying that our democracy and our society today is not able to do these changes. What are your thoughts about that? I mean, in terms of, you know, thinking radical about markets and trying to um, uh, implement a completely new system, how do you want to overcome um, what there is in terms of, you know, trying to keep the status quo and not making changes? You know, I'll, I'll tell you, I thought when I started out with this book, this would be ideas gradually diffuse. Five, six years later, we start to get some experimentation, blah, blah, blah. I was incredibly surprised by just how much happened so quickly around this. There is, in so many different pockets of our society, the desperate need for these things, and it cuts across so many different areas. There is the blockchain community, which has had this incredible incredible social movement, in some ways the most dynamic social movement, about basic questions of what is legitimacy in our society. There are all these funding organizations that are going around trying to get academics to think about what's beyond neoliberalism, what is the next economic paradigm, and they're desperate for action and real forward movement on this, and they're not seeing it, and they're, they're just like so incited to engage in this. There are libertarians, neoliberals out there, who are saying, we're losing the fight. The populists are coming. They're, they're going to break down immigration. They're going to break down trade. How do we defend this stuff? How do we make al new alliances? We're terrified of what's coming. There are 
students all over the place who are looking for a positive vision and don't see how to get active and, and to do something that would really make a difference. And they feel so divided against each other by the way that in which politics is going. The outpouring of interest, and, and who knows whether it'll happen, but th this organization, it, like the number of people who are interested, it's doubling every month. A and it doesn't seem to be stopping. I really think that people are ready for this and that the problem has been we academics we like to be so arrogant and condescending. We just stand in our ivory tower and we have our technocratic discussions and we don't talk to the people. And we don't talk to each other even. You know, economists, we, we think that all the sociologists don't have anything to say. And yet we don't listen to our own principles. And technologists, they're running off trying a million things, but they, they don't ever talk to academics who have really interesting ideas. And they don't talk to artists who can actually help people understand things in a different way. And the artists are dying to actually have some impact with their work. But they're not in community. You see, we're all so isolated. And if we can actually build these connections, and we can actually be inspired around ideas that can put people together like this, and they can cut, by getting outside the box, cut across these standard categories, I truly do believe we can build this sort of explosive social movement that can change the pervasive ideas in society. And it's been done before. It was done by the Mil Milton Friedman and the, and, and the neoliberals. It can be done for a, for a new purpose and in a new way in the future. I'm being told we're out of time, is that right? I think that yeah. uh, many would like to stay and ask more questions, but I'll, I'll just conclude by saying thank you very much to Glenn. As always, his discussions are inspiring and I think we all benefited from it. And thanks everyone uh, for coming along. Thanks, Christina. Thank